Good morning and welcome to Fairlawn United Church on this third Sunday of Lent. We're happy you have joined us for worship today. If you haven't already had a chance to check on the music bulletin, I would encourage you to do that. Eleanor Daly, once a week, puts uh, together this bulletin and choice of music, which you can at any point in the week access. Let's take a few moments um, as we get ready to go into the service just to settle ourselves in our places, whatever chair you're in, um, whether you're on a couch or a comfy chair or a hard chair like I am, and ready ourselves to worship God. Lent is traditionally a time for taking the pulse of our spiritual lives as well as our action and our presence in the world. It's a time to pause and look more at what is than at what could be. A time of repentance and honesty and reflection. Perhaps even a time of personal and institutional confrontation. This is our second uh, Lent that we have spent in the midst of a world pandemic in a lockdown, and we're all chafing a bit to have winter over, to have our doors and streets and cafes opened again. And the second time around, we're hoping that the vaccines work and that the COVID variants are contained, because we're all pretty tired by this point. The children are tired, teens are tired, and adults of every age are tired. We wait in our apartments and in our houses, in our much changed workplaces, some of us in our cramped home offices. We wait in all our limited spaces and places for a return to openness and normalcy. My seven-year-old grandson and his grandfather have recently started to meet on Zoom about three times a week in the early evening, and they're meeting just to read together. At the moment, they're on book three of The Magic Treehouse and on book one of Redwall. I listen from my chair over by the window as grandfather and grandson ground themselves in the magic of story in the sweetness of voice and imaginations let loose. They to be, he, appear to be having a really great time. And I, by extension, am included in their half hour of imaginary delight. I know we are in unprecedented time of crisis, but when I witness over and over again the stories of connection and reconnection that have come about because of the restrictions in our living and in our movements caused by the pandemic. I also see the resiliency and creativity shown as we make do with the time that we have. Let us pray. Loving God in such a place as this, without the stained glass and pillars, without the filled pews and the organ playing, but in this simple homemade space, our space, our home, we meet and trust that your love holds all of us through all things and holds us all here right now. May we make time, O oh God, to pause each day and reflect on what has been and wonder what has been worth holding on to, what has encouraged us, what has strengthened us, what has hurt us, what we have questioned. And in such reflection, may we begin to discover what is lasting, what is worth holding on to, what is worth letting go. And in such choices, may we choose the kind of future that is waiting for us when the doors open and we reshape the world once more. Amen.
In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the cleansing of the temple follows Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. It is near the end of the story. In John, however, the scene is moved closer to the beginning of Jesus' ministry, following immediately after Jesus' first sign, the wedding at Cana. The gospel goes from a small-scale wedding in Cana, where the wine has run out, to a very public activist statement in Jerusalem, in the temple and during Passover. The narration happens in real time, as if the reader can see everything that Jesus sees. It is not a long story, short on words, heavy on drama, and unsettling. This is not a gentle, listening Jesus. This is a confident, purposeful Jesus whose actions call for close attention. Something is happening here that catches our imagination and gives us pause. Why is Jesus tipping tables and what does this have to do with the kingdom of God and where we may find God? Listen carefully. Our reading today is from John 2, verses 13 to 22. Since it was almost a Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and pigeons, while money changers sat at their counters. Making a whip out of cords, Jesus drove them all out of the temple, even the cattle and the sheep, and overturned the tables of the money changers, scattering their coins. Then he faced the pigeon sellers. Take all of this out of here. Stop turning God's house into a market. The disciples remembered the words of scripture. Zeal for your house consumes me. The temple authorities intervened and said, what sign can you show us to justify what you've done? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. They retorted, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was speaking of was his body. It was only after Jesus had been raised from the dead that the disciples remembered the statement and believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. In this reading, we hear God's voice. God is still speaking. Thanks be to God. Slamming doors is a, is a very satisfying um, sort of thing to do. When you slam it in just the right way that it reverberates through the entire house. You know that feeling? You're upset about something, you've walked away from some argument, something has happened, and you need to let everyone in the house know how you feel. Sometimes you even do it with no one in the house. The slamming of the door is a way of saying this is really frustrating and I'm angry and I don't know where to go with that anger. As an adult, I've often used the car um, and getting away in the car as a way to deal with that. Because as an adult, you can't always slam doors, eh? Sometimes you're expected to be more grown up. So what I've often done is just get in a car and drive out of the community where I am or out of the city. And at uh, intervals to scream at the top of my lungs <laughs> and just get it out. Be quiet again and then scream again because if it's so pent in there, you can't, you have to let it out. Now, since I've moved back to Toronto, it's sort of harder to do that. So I just take long walks if I need to. I have a grandson who we had to teach not to slam doors because it was like the slamming of the doors it was dreadful. In our condo, you could hear it reverberate so much and that we were worried about what other people thought so we had to teach him that he actually could not slam doors that he could be angry he could say he was angry he could even holler but the slamming of the door was the one thing he could not do and so eventually he learned not to do that but what he would do still does actually 
is if he gets angry and he has his angry words and then he stomps away and he goes to the back bedroom and he opens the door as wide as he can and he stands ready to slam it and he looks at you and then very slowly closes the door. I'm not sure who the winner is there. But the door is not slammed. It's funny how we attempt to rein in anger um, at all points in our lives, but we never fully succeed. Um, so we talk about how we should be together um, and, and that expressing anger is often seen as not a good way to be together. But then what do we do with anger? Because anger is real. And boy, do we discourage anger in our churches to the point that we shut down often all real dialogue and discussion and learning that could happen because we are afraid of anger. I grew up with a Jesus who, um, who did not get angry. That's not the Jesus I remember from Sunday school. Jesus was always very kind and gentle, and Jesus loved me. As I got older, I discovered a Jesus who uh, could get pretty serious about things, very serious, in fact, uh, who spoke in riddles, who didn't know how to keep his place in society at all. He was always breaking rules, and who even could be out of control, like in our gospel lesson today. So here we have, it's, it, the story, of course, is, is, is in all of the Gospels. In this one, just because of where it is, because it takes place right at the beginning of the ministry uh, of Jesus, it's when this appears, it, it seems almost, almost jarring, um, um, out of control. You, you're, you're going from the wedding of Cana into this story where the scripture very calmly just says that since it was almost the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And uh, in the temple, he found people selling um, cattle and sheep and pigeons, and there were money changers. And you have this vision of, of Jesus standing in line with all the other pilgrims as they're coming into the temple. And, um, and what they have to do, of course, is, is they, they need to make sacrifices because since Moses, they've been making sacrifices. So that was part of the Passover um, a ritual. And it's not easy if you're coming in a distance to be hauling your, your cow or carrying your pigeon or trying to drag a sheep into a busy, busy city with thousands, maybe millions of people. So it's, it's way easier to purchase one of these animals that you're going to have sacrificed there. And so that's what everyone did. And you weren't able to take in your regular money that you would have either, whether it was Roman money or whatever it was, you were not able to take that into the temple because it, it was not holy. So you exchanged your, your, your secular money uh, for money that could be used in the temple. And so that's why, why the money changers were there. So you have Jesus seemingly sort of standing there in my mind that's what's happening Jesus is standing there he's watching all this and all of a sudden he does um, he does a very violent um, disruptive thing he uh, out of a cord um, makes a whip and he proceeds to scatter all the cattle and the sheep and to overturn the tables of the money changers and to go up to the pigeon sellers and saying, you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't make a, a, a market out of the temple, out of, out of God's place. And the temple authorities then question Jesus about that. They say, well, can you give us a sign about why you would do what you just did? And Jesus goes, well, yeah, okay. Destroy this temple destroy the temple and in three days I will build it up see what happens here is first of all the story seems sort of out of place just for whatever reason and also it seems rather out of character but it's also a story that means something to those early Christians who would have heard this story read or told to them 
But this is what happened. This is what happened when Jesus went and overturned the tables and, and threw out all the animals and the birds out of the temple. But it means something to those early Christians that if the story is true, the hearers wouldn't have understood in any way, would they? So it's a peculiar story. But one clearly that was important enough that all the Gospels have it in some form or other. The story of the Jesus who got angry and, and who, who did something that was so, so far out that it's like everyone stopped and watched and waited to see what it meant. So what does it mean? There's something about the story itself that says that Jesus was upset about all the rigmarole around the festival itself, the Passover, which was so important to his people. Because Jesus was Jewish, of course. So a very important festival that was going on and people sacrificed in order to come to the city and be a part of that. And to have all these layers in between them able to come in and properly do what they needed to do as a Jew um, was wrong. There was something wrong about all these, about having to exchange your money, about having to buy your animals, about all the kerfuffle that was going on around you. So there's that aspect of it. There's also the other aspect of what if Jesus was also pointing out that it was not just that there were things preventing people from, from actually being to be able to be in worship um, with their God, but also that in fact were they not maybe being contained by the temple? Was Jesus saying in this action somehow that God is outside this temple as well as within. We can't contain God within a building, within a temple, within a church, within a congregation. We can't contain God. Every place according to Celtic spirituality has the capacity to be a thin place. In the Celtic understanding where our world and the eternal spiritual reality collapse and become um, thin and almost transparent. Because God's presence in Jesus is set loose in the world and is no longer confined to the temple or the church. And these thin places are places in our very normal interaction in the world where God becomes nearer to us and our sense, our understanding of the holy is felt. In the story of the temple cleansing, there is nothing godly about responding to complacency or injustice with passive acceptance or unexamined complicity. But that's what we do a lot, don't we? It didn't just happen in the temple. It happens in our own churches and in our own lives that we respond to injustice with a passive acceptance. And we do not examine our own complicity in what is happening. And as a church, we are being challenged about that now. Because that's where our present struggle is with a rising intolerance in our world towards the other race, the other culture, the other faith. It is a presence in church communities struggling these past months with concepts of white privilege and racism and classism. And we hide behind our good manners and our smiles. The work that caused Jesus' ire in Jerusalem, what was going on the, um, behind the scenes in, that, in the temple, is the same kind of work we need to be about today. 
and that we need to clear things away and understand we can't put anything in the way of someone's um, a belief and understanding about God. That has to be something that is negotiated between God and the person. We, we can't make that difficult to happen in how we do church, in how we worship, in how we welcome people. And it won't be easy for us to look at our own complicity and to understand that unintentionally, unintentionally sometimes, but also sometimes intentionally, we make it difficult for people to experience and understand God. So it won't be easy. There will be a cost. But without true reconciliation and accountability and transformation, there is no gospel. There is no good news. No kingdom presence. I think that's the heart of the story. I don't think it's meant to be an easy story. Whether it really happened or not. For the early church, this story allowed them to understand what Jesus was about, to show that God is everywhere and that God's love is not bounded by race, by color of skin, by culture, by language, by religion, that God is bigger than all of that. And that our task in the lives that we lead is to try the best we can to create a world that allows that bigger understanding of God and how we are to be together. Not an easy task. I want to end with um, these words from a Byzantine Christian monk, Simeon. For if we genuinely love him, we wake up inside Christ's body, where all our body, all over every most hidden part of it, is realized in joy as him, and he makes us utterly real. And everything that is hurt, everything that seemed to us shadowed, harsh, shameful, maimed, ugly, irreparably damaged, is in him transformed and recognized as whole, as lovely, and radiant in his light. He awakens as the beloved in every last part of our body. Amen. We will now hear a quartet sung by Fairlawn's treble section leads. Oh, see, see, 
Whether you are new to worship uh, at Fairlawn or a regular, I do encourage you to keep up with the news and events that we have to offer, some small group offerings and outreach opportunities. And to do this by going online and checking out our newsletter as well as the website. If you have never attended a group study before, especially one on Zoom, it's a very easy way to dip your toes in the water. After Easter, we'll be offering some new opportunities for study groups together. I also encourage you, if you are able, to stay through for our chat at coffee time. You just go on to the same page with the invitation for the Zoom service, and you'll be able to come in on the coffee chat time. Thank you for all who contribute so many ways to keep Fairlawn present in the community and to encourage the care and the support of its members. We appreciate all you are able to do. Let us pray. We are halfway through Lent, O oh God, and we are faced often with real desolation. Hear us as we pray at this time, prayers that groan in our souls, prayers that know God doesn't mean someone who steps in and sorts it all out like some tooth fairy, but that you stand in the desolation and weep at the loss and suffering and at all that brings it. And so we pray for the people of the world, not knowing often what else we can do, but live in relationship with silence, that we may feel our humanity with each other for the sake of that humanity. And in places of conflict and in the continual suffering there, governing our humanity and the shock of what we become and who we do deals with in the name of economy and trade. God, may we hold your silence that speaks into this week. May we recognize who we have become in the conflicts of this week. May we perceive ourselves as we really are compared to creation's power. And bring those people who hold us in that life, in relationships with one another, our family and friends, those ill and those recovering, those worried and those anxious. Hear us, O oh God, as we pray that we return to right relationships with the world and with each other. So be it, dear God. And as children turn to a mother who watches over them, let us turn to God saying this prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may God lead you to openness that grants understanding. May God guide you to accountability that begins restoration. May God inspire you to transforming love that celebrates all people and all creation. Go in peace. Amen.